I'm Ravi Dar, Professor of Marketing at Yale School of Management, and today I have with me Salman Amin, who's the Executive Vice President of Sales and Marketing at PepsiCo. He was on Yale campus talking, so I thought I'll take the opportunity to ask him a few questions on marketing. Welcome. Yeah. Thank you. So let me start by asking you really about uh, PepsiCo's mantra, if not the mission. Uh, you see it written a lot about performance with purpose. Uh, my question is really, what does it mean for the sales and marketing function within Pepsi? So it's a great question, Ravi. I think actually performance with purpose is entirely integral to what we are doing in marketing, for example. The reality is that consumers today are looking for a greater meaning from brands. It's not just that we speak to them in a way that's relevant. It's not just that we offer them products that are well differentiated and that taste good. Uh, it's also, they're saying, what more are you doing for the society we live in? So we are bringing purpose, particularly the purpose side to life with our brands, for example, in how we are reformulating them uh, in many of our Fun For You brands, how we are focusing on our Good For You brands like Quaker and Tropicana, how we are t going forward in terms of the environment by, by working in partnership with groups like the Carbon Trust in the UK, where we are measuring our carbon footprint, where we are working on water conservation projects and finding ways to work our way towards a, a net zero uh, company. Uh, so all of these things, as you start to put the brand stories together and you talk about how these brands are uh, uh, integrally focused in these areas, makes a difference to how consumers are viewing our brands. So it's very much a part of what our brand strategies are all about. You mentioned sustainability or the environment, so obviously you can think of sustainability along many different dimensions, so whether it's the environment, the water conservation, uh, carbon emissions. And one of the things I find, some of the research we did, is like consumers seems to say they care about these things, and there's obviously a core group which really cares about it, and the others are not willing to compromise on the core benefit of the product. So let's say it's a detergent. Yes, they care if it's friendly to the environment, but if it doesn't clean as well, they worry about it. Do you find uh, similar uh, issues in your, in your categories that that matters? And which of these aspects of sustainability like, you know, are more important to your consumers or within Pepsi, how do you look at it to decide what should we focus on, given that there's so many of these things out there? Right. So, um, you know, one of the principles uh, that we followed, you know, is the reality is we are a food and beverage company. And everything we sell has to taste fantastic all the time. So when we started to reformulate our products and as we've gone forward, one of our absolute non-negotiables internally was we will make no trade-off in taste. So that was the guardrail we put around all of our reformulation efforts to say, you know what, we are going to go and, and not do the either or thing. We're going to do the and and. So we, that's why it's taken us a bit longer in some cases to reformulate our products because we really wanted to ensure that the taste performance is as good as it's ever been, if not better while delivering reductions in, in sodium or saturated fat in some cases or measuring uh, our impact on the environment, we've made sure that nothing interferes with the taste. That's kind of interesting and does it create sort of across your portfolio, obviously you have a lot of different brands and does it create uh, more of a challenge for uh, say beverage brands or food brands or kind of food brands? Is it easier to do at some end of the port spectrum of the portfolio? Yeah. No, I, I think um, th there are challenges with all of our brands when you start to do that, when you say we're going to take something that's integral out and, and uh, we don't want the taste to change. It's, it's not necessarily an easy exercise. The good news for PepsiCo has been that we've worked on these technologies for many, many years. Our R&D and food science uh, our teams are incredibly adept at this. So it's been a uh, a journey that's been in the making for the last five to eight years, the fruits of which we are beginning to see now as we roll these new products out. You also mentioned that, you know, broadly speaking, you have brands that are fun for you and brands that are good for you in the portfolio. And one of the issues is really, you know, and this is across the whole industry, if you find that how do we get people to eat uh, 
or consume more of the good for you things. And one way to do it is through innovation, which is try to make the fun for you brands also good for you, which is, you know, so taking some of the ingredients out or putting in more healthy ingredients. And the second is obviously what we call behavioral change, right? Get people to consume less or exercise or uh, engage in other activities and manage a balanced lifestyle. In other words, like, you know, you still eat a combination of things. And as a marketer, you probably end up doing a little bit of both. So I think when you were at PepsiCo UK, you did, you know, you were engaging in some of the health initiatives at PepsiCo. What are some of the things that you did, sort of the lessons learned, which you think translates across nations maybe that, or some of the challenges in doing that? So I think th there's a few things that are important to do, and th th these are not alternatives. I think we need to do all of these. The first one is, I think it's really important to communicate the benefits of a balanced diet. Okay? And at PepsiCo, there's no debate in our mind that we have to communicate to people what a balanced diet is about. The second thing, which goes very closely with the balanced diet, is to create the balance between diet and exercise. And how do we do that? Third is information. How do we make our products and our packages uh, more informative such that people know what they're actually consuming in each packet or each bottle, right? So we've been very focused on labeling initiatives, front of pack labeling. We are part of a coalition of food manufacturers and retailers that have aligned together to say we're gonna have standard labels, which is exactly what we did in the UK starting in 2006 uh, when we went to a standard label. But we didn't stop there. We said, you know, we also then need to focus on consumers and help them understand how to interpret those labels. So industry came together as a group and funded a campaign in the UK which focused over a multi-year period of time, three years actually, uh, to say, t teach people how to interpret those labels and what do they mean in the context of a balanced diet. Those are the sorts of initiatives that are critical for us to be focused on as we go forward in order to create a society that is well-informed and makes choices that are right for itself. No, it's interesting you mentioned that because we certainly find certain type of consumers who read labels and the question is how do you get, you know, and even the small thing that you mentioned taking from the back of the packaging to the front of the packaging, at one level, how hard is it to turn the pack around? But in, in the world of, you know, CPG products, I think those little things can make a lot of difference in terms of awareness and processing. So what we did was we tracked very diligently uh, awareness of the new front of pack labels, comprehension mm -hmm. of those new front of pack labels, and usage, importantly. Because those three taken together over a longer period of time will create behavior change. And we found that because of the investment in the education campaign, the numbers actually started to climb very rapidly. And the majority of the population first was became aware, then started to understand them, and then started to use it. I think the broader question you're asking is, how long does it take to create lasting behavior change? And I think that is a multi-year process, because people got used to purchasing things a certain way and consuming without necessarily understanding what they're consuming. And the process of having clearer, fact-based, objective labels that put the facts there and teaching people how to interpret them, I think is a very powerful process that in the years to come, I'm very confident will pay dividends. Great. Let me ask you, you're the Executive Vice President of Sales and Marketing. So normally in a lot of firms, these uh, functional areas are quite separate, siloed. Uh, and the idea of integrating it obviously makes a lot of sense. Tell me some of the things that you do which seems to be working or any examples that you might have of what you did of integrating this that really pays or is going to, you think it's going to pay dividends if it's ongoing. Yeah, I um, we, we, look, we have the belief in PepsiCo that what we need to build in the next generation of leaders coming up at PepsiCo is commercial acuity. Because the reality is the world where customers were at one end of the spectrum are retail customers and partners and brands were at the other end of the spectrum, that day is long gone. We have to develop, we have to innovate, and we have to build brands recognizing the roles that our customers play as well as what consumers are desiring. So to me, this microcosm is already one. And the quicker that we can create 
an awareness of what it means to work together with customers and consumers and start to create the sensitivity in both our sales leaders as well as our marketing leaders, I think the better off we are going to be. Now, it is a change. It is an evolution. Um, it will take some time uh, of doing it continuously for many years for it to really make a lasting change, but we have started that journey. And we've started with small steps, in some cases moving people from big sales roles to big marketing roles and the other way around, um, uh, but also starting to build an appreciation for why this is so important because our customers have their own brands too. Virtually all big customers have private label brands, which they do a very adequate job of marketing. They're quite good at it. So we have to continue to up our game to create those differentiated propositions. And understanding both sides of that, I think, is critical going forward. You mentioned many of your customers have their own store brands, so that leads to a natural question. And uh, when I talk to a lot of the CPG companies, they vary on the idea of whether or not they should make store brands. Uh, some say, especially during a recession or a downturn, they have some excess capacity. They obviously have the know-how and the capability to make that soup or the toothpaste or the detergent or the soda. And if their customers are asking, hey, why don't you make some soda where we can put our name on it, um, would you do that? And I think I find that companies vary on it. Uh, Procter & Gamble says they would not do that at all. I think they have some legacy purchase they did with Duracell where they, they have it. But it's a very firm belief that it's not a good idea to do it. And I was just wondering, what is your thoughts on it? Where does PepsiCo, how does it think about its own uh, brand versus making some uh, products for its customers as a store brands. So at PepsiCo, we are very clear on our mission. We are a house of brands. And we've built these brands over a long period of time. And I think we're very comfortable building brands that we believe are well differentiated from anyone else's brands. And that's frankly what gives us the reason to be. There is no reason for PepsiCo to exist if we could not deliver differentiated brands that are consumer preferred and make sense for our shareholders. So we are very much in the camp of saying we are very comfortable making and, and marketing our own brands and have no plans to, to, to start to manufacture brands for others. I noticed the other thing is that a lot of the beverage brands that you have are much more global in terms of the same brands in many different countries. You do have obviously local beverage brands also, but the food business tends to be more local in terms of, while you do have obviously some global brands, but they seem to have many names that are specific to the different countries. Do you think it's harder to build global brands in certain categories like, let's say, food because it's inherently cultural meaning versus in beverages, or it's just a way of acquisition, how it developed? What is your yeah. take on that? Yeah. So it's a very interesting question, actually. If you, It's absolutely true that food is largely local. There's no doubt. Tastes are locally driven. After all, if you look at from country to country, there's, a f there's many things that unite us, but there's a few things that make us unique in a given country. Food and, and cuisine is one of it. Language is another. Music is another. So in that context, um, uh, food brands, yeah, tend to be very local. That said, what we've done with brands like Lay's and Doritos and Quaker is we've said, while the taste that we will deliver in a given country may be different, the brand positioning, the brand architecture, the brand guardrails, they will be the same everywhere. So that's point number one. And to your point on beverages, it's really interesting because I would actually uh, segment beverages into a couple of areas. If you look at colas, um, um, that's largely true. It's the same profile everywhere. If you look at non-carbonated beverages, some of the teas, if you look at juice, drinks, etc., those actually tend to be very, very local again. And in that arena, we are, again, similar to the food brands, uh, we are very focused on what those local tastes are. So why do you think that is? Is that because the, those tea and coffee, is, it's sort of closer to food? Or is it because they have, because tea, or is it that tea is made differently in different leaves? I mean, so, and tea was just an example of what you meant, yeah. other types of beverages as so, well. So I think um, it's really interesting. I think all food and beverage is local. The only thing that's different is cola, because there is no indigenous cola drink in any country. This is a flavor that is an acquired flavor that has come in over the top, so to speak, horizontally around the world. And it's perhaps the only 
food and beverage category that tends to have very little variance. That's interesting. I think that reminds me of, uh, I was discussing with uh, one of the Indian retailers and he said it was easier to do well in categories where there was no obvious substitutes in India. So for example, if they had an alternative way of making that product versus no such thing existed, uh, the, the takeoff was much faster in some sense. So cell phones was an example, like it just took off because there was the landlines were just non-existent in some sense. But where you had a close substitute, let's say you had unorganized retailing, which kind of does the job pretty well in these countries, the organized retailing is finding it much harder to take off. So Tola, to your point, I think was, uh, didn't really have any obvious substitute, whereas if you have a global tea brand, you always had a local tea brand or a local way of making it, which might have made it harder for global brands to build connections with the consumers. You know, the, the, I, I think you're right. The only sort of slight difference in how I might say it is, I think we will forever have local tastes, but that should not preclude the building of global brands in the sense of the architecture, the graphics, the look, the feel of the brand, what it stands for in a portfolio. Because you're right, almost all food and beverage brands tend to be analogs for something that's in the local right. cuisine. Right. Let me ask you, we talked about brand building and so certainly in Pepsi's case, uh, and many, many of the companies now, traditional way of building brands, you know, spend a lot of money on TV advertising, which is still the mainstay for most of these large brands, but more and more they're sort of putting their feet into the world of social media. And what is the role you think that social media plays in brand building? Like how does it fit into the bigger piece of everything else that you do to brand build or brand sustaining, if you like? What are some of the pluses, the minuses of using it? Yeah. You know, I step back and I ask myself the question, what do I need to do to continue to engage my consumers, right? How continuously do I need to do that? In which ways do I need to do that such that my brands stay differentiated? And when I ask a question that way, social media, digital media takes on a place of its own because our consumers are consuming social media. So it's incumbent upon us to be present there and to find ways to talk to consumers. For me, it's been an ad-ad. Um, I don't think traditional media like television is going to go away anytime soon. In fact, if you look at other mediums like print, print is actually prospering. People, everyone said magazines are dead and newspapers will be dead. The reality is there's a lot of volume going through that and readerships are doing okay. Um, so there is a role for what we would call classic media sitting right alongside social media or digital media. And, and from our perspective, we intend to make full use of all of those as long as they're available to us. Do you worry about the, so the amplifying nature of social media for word of mouth or other things has both the plus side and obviously the minus side because everything gets amplified and we know that negative word of mouth is more likely, people who are unhappy are more likely to complain than people who are satisfied. and. So part of the challenge is how do you manage a media where you have less control than what you as managers are accustomed to? And so what is, uh, and so as a result, you find often extreme that people don't want to do certain things on social media because they feel they lose control. And, and how to manage that process of not having full control in the brand building or the messaging. And obviously you have a range of people in the company and range of brands, do you find like people who embrace this are different in some ways than people who are worry about this or it's as a company you find that you guys are pretty, everybody seems you know ready to jump in? Uh, you know, I don't think at PepsiCo we are debating the value of social media. I think we all buy into that. I think the question is where does the control reside to your, to your core question? And I have, I have a firm belief that the control has always resided with consumers. They always had a choice to say yes or no to your proposition. It's just become more pronounced over the last, say, five to 10 years. And it is absolutely critical for us to go and embrace it. Despite all the uncertainties, despite all the risks, it would be silly of us not to go out there and learn what we need to be doing differently or better. And yeah, there will be some learning sometimes uh, 
difficult learnings that we're going to have to embrace, but we need to be out there uh, in the space that our consumers are in. Great. So last question is really on the career advice for students. So somebody who's going out into the world of marketing today, or even broadly in career in general management, uh, based on your experience and the changes that you see in the world, what are sort of two or three skills that you think are really critical in being successful in today's world? You know, uh, the, the, the few things I would say. One is change will be eternal in, in, in the young person's life who's coming out of university today, business school, undergraduate. They're going to see a greater, faster rate of change than perhaps Ravi, you and I did over the last 20 years. So the first thing I would say to him is learn to embrace change. And don't take change as an adversary, but as something to say it's just going to be there. And that requires young people to build a healthy tolerance for ambiguity and to learn to prosper despite change, despite not having certainty around them. How do you actually uh, move forward? That's one. Second, uh, learning agility. Okay? I think the world where we are creating information, where consumers change as rapidly as they do, our competition changes as rapidly as it does. Our ability to be learning agile and say we will continuously be students, I think is critical. The third, I would say, is to how can you be more articulate? You have to be able to take complex problems and simplify them. I think it's critical to build the skills that allow people to explain in simple words what complex problems are all about. And last but not least is resiliency. Because it's a difficult world, because change is thrust upon us and we can't control it, it can create difficult times or a feeling of stress. And I would say our ability to ride through it, to be resilient, to take some of the adverse things that happen and still keep going forward will be critical for young people going forward. Good. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ravi.